Hello, ladies. Greetings. How are both of you? I'm doing great and so excited to see you both. Excellent. We're excited to be here. And I, I have loved learning a little bit more about F sharp. I am not, uh, I don't come from a C sharp, F sharp, .net background at all. Um, but seeing the great tooling that's being created is really inspiring and learning about uh, folks' use cases, especially in data science. Uh, I, I'm really excited to, to share some of the, the things that we've observed. And then Maria is also going to do uh, awesome uh, deep dives on the .NET interactive piece. Um, so it's, it's very cool. <laughs> Hey, Maria, just I want to check that your mic is on. So can you say something? Yeah, I don't think we can hear you yet. Yep, there there might be a mute button in the in the browser. I know that these uh, the conference, the conference software is all like it feels like it's different for every single one. Yeah. Um, yep. But any better now? Yes. yes. Absolutely. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. I think my fancy mic is no longer working. I think oh, no. it's done its time. It's done its time. I think I've had it for like six years. You know. Oh, no. All right. I tried. So, I'm trying to to ask for a new one. Then. <laughs> so, thank you, <laughs> so ladies. Cool. I'm excited to hear more about polyglot notebooks. Uh, I'm always curious and I always find it fascinating that topic um, and always leave with full of ideas of how I could use that in my world my world and my day to day so take it away right. perfect Myra. excellent thank you so much so so to begin with uh, I guess we could do very brief introductions and then uh, kind of a roadmap for the conversation today is I'll start off with presenting the most minimal number of slides possible uh, to kind of set the stage for why polyglot notebooks are interesting, kind of the, the usual suspects in the space today, and then also why .NET Interactive and the .NET Interactive notebook experience within VS Code is so compelling uh, as, a, as a Python and R person uh, coming into this community. Yeah. Um, Excellent. So Maria, do you want to start with introductions? Or? Yeah, absolutely. My name is Maria Nagaga. I work on .NET Interactive as well as parts of ASP.NET. So I focus like on .NET minimalism. And .NET Interactive has been a fun experience. Like Paige, I am not an F# -sharp developer. <laughs> um, like F# -sharp is like a huge reason why we did this multi-language notebooks because we do see it as a really huge push in the .NET ecosystem for data scientists, right? Giving us, bringing data science workloads to our users. And unfortunately today, like most of my demos will be slides because I have an incredibly slow machine. So I need an upgrade with that as well, but I do have everything recorded and I hope you enjoy it. Awesome. Excellent. And my name is Paige. I am, a, I am a PM based in the developer tools division and I get to work on really interesting projects uh, in the machine learning and data science space. So for example, uh, code spaces, building out the data science story there, uh, as well as machine learning integrations in developer tools. So um, if you've seen recently uh, some of the interesting stuff around Copilot, uh, around IntelliCode, I get to work with those teams uh, and, and sort of help test out that functionality and, and you know brainstorm new opportunities for machine learning to be impactful. Uh, in, in developer tooling. So, uh, so with that, I will uh, begin presenting my screen. And this is the first time uh, that I've used this software as well. So bear with me uh, if, uh, if things do not go as planned. Um, so sharing screen, sharing window, uh, and soon you should see uh, you should see VS Code in the background. So, so I'm assuming that everybody can see my screen. Um, if you can't, uh, feel free to, uh, like Maria, shout out uh, that you cannot. Uh, and I can see it. Excellent, beautiful. We have we have success. So, so this is VS Code. 
Uh, I, uh, it is my great pleasure to inform everyone that uh, if you, like me, are perhaps not a fan of slides uh, as, as uh, you know, uh, done via, via PowerPoint or slides.google.com, uh, you can totally do slides within VS Code uh, using the MARP extension. Uh, so you can see here that I've got Markdown written off to the left uh, and a preview off to the right. And I am going to expand out. And so hopefully you should see kind of a, a big full screen version um, of the slides that we'll be presenting today. So this conversation about polyglot notebooks, I think it's important for us to kind of say, uh, well, what are notebooks and why are they useful? Um, and how do they exist today? Uh, and what you can see on the screen here is an example of a notebooks-based environment um, called Jupyter Lab. This is uh, the ArcGIS extension in particular for Jupyter Lab. Um, but it's really a great way to mix data, data visualization, and descriptions of data all in one place. So it's a really effective communication tool um, for this kind of work. Uh, and when Jupyter Notebooks first started, uh, they were they were really intended to be, you know, just kind of that, like a like a fancy REPL with some markdown, some Python code interspersed. Uh, and, and, you know, just kind of a way to, to communicate analysis. Um, but over time, these notebooks have evolved to be many, many different things to people. And so notebooks today are, uh, you perhaps have heard of Jupyter Notebooks, Jupyter Lab, uh, Interact, uh, and, and many other notebook environments. Um, they're used from everything uh, for uh, uh, for automating and running makeshift integration tests with things like MBDev, um, to preparing, delivering, and checking student coursework with NBGrader, to generating API documentation. So you perhaps have a notebook uh, with Markdown and with code, and you run it nightly as a cron job, and it generates an HTML output that's then uh, doing a notebook documentation for your library. Um, and the nice thing is, is that you can develop tests for that, right? Like, so if you make an API change, um, and then suddenly all of the code that you have and all of the descriptions in your notebooks uh, break, then that's a great indication to the dev team that, you know, perhaps, uh, this notebook, uh, you know, it indicates that the API change was uh, was problematic and we should, you know, roll back. Um, you can also publish books, PDF documents, um, full websites, slides using notebooks. Uh, you can uh, have it as an interactive pseudo IDE for data analysis. You can do uh, large scale data pre-processing jobs. You can create interactive embedded web content. Uh, you have fully featured IDEs, you have uh, automated uh, customer support and troubleshooting guides as run books, um, and you can also create uh, these shareable data analysis artifacts. Um, so there are really just so many different uh, and very creative ways that people have evolved notebooks over time. Um, and today I, I really wanna to focus in on, on this segment right here, uh, which are, um, you know, Databricks, Polynote, Zeppelin Notebooks, and .NET Interactive um, that allow you to, uh, to do multi-language uh, uh, multi notebooks and to, to sort of support these, these large-scale workflows. And so multi-language notebooks um, are, are quite compelling for a number of reasons. Uh, and it's and it's largely because um, you know back in the day I, I used to be a, a data scientist and a machine learning engineer, um, uh, but you would you would create this beautiful analysis. Perhaps it's using Python or R, um, and Python and R as languages, um, you know they're they're great at many things, but they also leave uh, a bit to be desired. If you're if you're moving into a production context, so so I'm not sure if folks on the call are familiar with something called pandas, um, but pandas is a Python library for data preprocessing. If you need to do it on kind of in memory data sets, uh, you know it, it works nicely. If you're just doing it on CSVs, 
if you want to take that model and to move it to work on large scale streaming data, um, then pandas suddenly does not work quite as well. Uh, and, and perhaps you would need to, to re-architect uh, this experiment where your data input pre-processing steps are in something like C Sharp or in Java or, or Scala or you know something else um, that's a bit more performant. Uh, and so taking these analyses into production, it can get quite complex. And even if the entire like sort of prototype of a, of a model or a data analysis might be implemented in Python or R, um, the big, big, broad scheme of things, uh, the data validation steps, the data extraction, kind of these ETL pipeline building steps, the steps for, for building and testing and uh, having pipeline components, um, all of this uh, gets rewritten into, into other languages and um, sort of your, your notebook, uh, even though it has to be maintained over time and updated, Gets, it gets kind of dismantled and dispersed into these disparate files. And for maintenance purposes, that's terrifying because you, you don't, yep. And you, and you don't, and I, I can't see, I can't see my, uh, like the, the people part. So if, if I, I, I heard, I think I heard something. So if, if I, if I like, if I steamroll ahead, just be like, Hey, you know, like, and yeah, this was me agreeing. I was just like, I just like, it's hard to maintain. I was like, mm -hmm. that was awesome. nice. excellent. And so, and Maria understands it better than anybody else. It's like the, 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 the sort of um, breaking apart pieces of a notebook and, uh, you know, dismantling it is, is a nightmare for maintenance purposes because you end up with all of these disparate files that are managed by perhaps different teams, different people, they're in different languages, when it would really just be lovely to, you know, just say, oh, hey, like this original notebook, here's all of the bit pieces and components um, that comprise this experiment. And if, you know, later on down the line, you need to update the analysis, the data scientist can say like, okay, well, this pandas logic maps to this Scala logic. And so, you know, Scala person, I made these modifications to the pandas piece, like, please make those same modifications to your Scala piece. And so, uh, yes, so, so the answer is, how does it go into production? Very painfully. Uh, unless you have something like a, a multi-language solution for notebooks. Uh, and with that, um, I am going to, to hand it over um, to, to Maria to talk a little bit about .NET Interactive Notebooks uh, and about some of the really interesting work and experiments her teams have been doing uh, to bring this to VS Code. Uh, the visualization that you see here is from a delightful Medium blog post from, um, from Andre uh, about F Sharp and how it can be used from data science. Um, but he's, he's going through and, and kind of using the .NET interactive functionality in order to visualize and understand his data set. Um, and with that, uh, I will stop sharing uh, and we can go into Maria's demos. Thank you so much, Paige. So let me go ahead and also share this as well. So I'm just going to share and pick a screen. Cool. Let's do that. I know I've done StreamYard before, but I, 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 I'm always, always a little bit nervous. So uh, let me know if you can see my screen and what yes. it looks like. Perfect. So I wanted to kind of start by saying that when .NET Interactive, when we first pitched it, not when it was pitched to my team as an idea, um, it was one word. Hey, ML.NET and Spark.NET need um, Jupyter Notebooks, and that was it. So they reached out to our team, who had built the Try.NET experience, and we're all about how do we run code independently and also together. So notebooks actually felt like a natural fit for us. So the first version of .NET Interactive were completely compatible with all the popular Jupyter front end. So Jupyter Labs, Jupyter Notebooks, 
um, interact, .NET Interactive will work the same as it will in VS Code, just minus a few things, like you won't get the same level of IntelliSense that you would get in VS Code as well. But I really wanted to talk about multi-language and why multi-language was important for us as a team. So as I said, um, we got this, and let me just start my slides. I do not have fancy slides that look like they are in VS Code, but I'll try. So when we were talking to our users and we were talking to the chief data scientist over at Citibank in the United Kingdoms, he mentioned all these problems that Paige had shared with you, where you're working with your engineering team that is using something else and you give them your model in Python and then they look at it and they're just like, how do I transfer this into C Sharp? How am I able to leverage the libraries that are popular in Python or JavaScript for their visualization? And he told, us, he told us, like, the most important thing for us is the ability to use the right language for the job without the need for a wrapper. So Donut Interactive today has F Sharp, C Sharp, PowerShell, SQL, JavaScript, HTML, and I hope so many more languages in the future. So let's jump into what this experience is like. The goal of this experience is to use the best language for the task at hand without a need to need for a wrapper. So far, we support six languages out of the box. C Sharp and F Sharp, we announced in 2019. PowerShell in 2020, that was brought in by the PowerShell team. JavaScript and HTML support the same month. This allowed us to open up the doors to create rich visualization without the need for a wrapper. Like, we're just like, just build a wrapper around it. And we're just like, no, if you want to copy and paste a D3JS sample and access a C-sharp variable from there, you should be able to do that. And this year, we um, introduced SQL support with the SQL team. And we also had the added benefit of richer visualization that didn't require anyone to write any code at all. Right? So those are like all these rich experiences. So what does .NET Interactive look like today in VS Code? And what can you expect? Overall, richer tooling experience. So you can see IntelliSense, right? That's really cool. And we also made the need to have an optional Python dependency. So when we initially introduced Jupyter, the biggest feedback that we got specifically from our .NET customers are like, why do I have to install Anaconda and Jupyter Labs and all this stuff and, <coughs> sorry, and Python in order just to use a .NET notebook. So with VS Code, all you need is VS Code and the .NET Interactive extension, and you are good to go. So what really makes us super cool, like as you said, polyglot, multi-language notebooks are incredibly important, but being the ability to switch from one language to the other is great. But the ability to share a variable from one language to the next between cells is huge. Like in this sample over here, I have the variable X that was defined in C Sharp. I accessed it in HTML while going through JavaScript. And you can also run the exact same multiple languages in a single cell as well, which can make it really good for things like scripting, right? Or being plugging in your DevOps pipeline. So we wanted to create these experiences that just felt absolutely natural to the scenarios that even non-data scientists, like people who are in C Sharp developers, would just feel like, oh, I could benefit from this experience. Um, as I mentioned that we have SQL support. SQL support for me is one of the funnest things that we've done. Um, when we did this, we said, wouldn't it be cool if we got code completion on the SQL schema? So as you're writing in your code and you, you've accessed the SQL database, you're actually getting code completion. And then you can also quickly scaffold DB context to use lit. Right, which is incredibly important for our customers as well. So if you're a C-sharp developer and you want to switch to using EF and using Link, you can do that really easily and get the same experience that you'd get, let's say, in VS. And then Java, native JavaScript support. As I mentioned earlier, in this example, we defined a variable in C-sharp, and then we're able to access that exact same variable right within JavaScript using interactive C Sharp, get a variable of C Sharp, and then being able to render it using D3JS, right? And then you're able to bounce between the different languages. Like, okay, I'm gonna like set a task, run it through a range, and you begin to see the visualizations controlled in a language that you feel most native to. 
And the other thing that I also wanted to make sure that we did is being able to leverage popular ecosystems that exist within the Jupyter space. Like Interact has an amazing data explorer. So we created a way for people to just naturally get the data explorer um, in to, to display their data with just using a method. So by just simply doing dot with Interact Data Explorer, you get this visualization. No extra configuration. You just had to give it an object to work with. And we're also able to do the exact same thing with Sundance, which I think is an incredibly rich library. So everything that we use here is pulled through an extension. You use what you need. So I'm just going to fast forward a bit over here. And you get like you get like cool visualizations like this, right? And you can spin them around. And like the user gets this by just adding an extension. And that's what we wanted for customers. We've also seen people create their own extensions as well that sit on top of the .NET Interactive. There's someone in the community who built a Razor extension. We have people building ASP.NET extensions so they can test um, their APIs instead of using something like Postman. And these are just like things that people just naturally feeling is a great fit for notebooks. Oh, and this is one of my favorites. So being able to render real-time live stream data is huge. And in this sample, what we're doing over here is that we're getting data from a thermostat and we're going to actually render it in a pretty cool visualization. So I'm just going to switch over here. What we're getting over here is that we're able to pull in this JSON file do all the data processing in C-sharp and get this really nice 3D beautiful visualization just running in a notebook. You can think of this as a great way for education, a great way for you to build samples and tools. And when I was looking at Houston's demo before, I was just like, oh, yeah, Houston could have pumped his data through something like this and get this really cool visualization, which would have both an IoT effect as well as this rich visualization that you get within a notebook. And like that is all I have for the experiences, and I'd really like to have it, you know, open to the floor for questions. Absolutely, and it's so exciting for me to see this exist. Um, the the data science projects that I that I do usually follow the same general format, which is you're always trying to pull in data with SQL. Um, yep. Or with, uh, or if you're in Microsoft land, it's Kusto. Uh, yes. But you're, yep. But you're pulling in, you're pulling in the data. You're potentially pre-processing it with R because you know the tidyverse tools are just beautiful and and really uh, sort of intuitive and uh, you know like standard APIs, really elegantly documented. And then for algorithms, you're probably using one of the great Python libraries. So scikit-learn, if you're doing traditional machine learning, or if you're attempting to do deep learning, you know, perhaps PyTorch, TensorFlow, Jax. Uh, and then visualizations, like you could either use a Python library or an R library to generate the JavaScript, or you could like fiddle with it yourself. But it's, yeah. but it's all like this multi-language process. Um, and I'm really, really hopeful that we can get Python and R added to the to the you know the omni kernel that your team has created for Jupyter notebooks and for notebooks in VS Code, um, so that we can open up this to even more user types. Absolutely, um, and I was doing a user study today, and the users and it was with a group of students, and they said, you know, I use Python and R, but usually I have to like switch over to R Studio or open up a new notebook and then figure out how to share the data from one place to the other. And I was like, imagine if you could do this, right? Like you had it in a single notebook. And then we show them the JavaScript support, and they're just like, what? There's a job? There's JavaScript support in notebooks? I was like, yeah, and it's pretty neat, right? So people are naturally just feeling the need for multi-language notebooks, whether you're a student who's doing AI and machine learning, or you're a person um, with troubleshoot guides where they're seeing a huge need for multi-language notebooks, and data scientists who are just like, I need to mix all these different languages in order to feel productive in my work, right? So I think there's a huge space opportunity for us here. Absolutely. And the, the .NET Interactive experience, it also works in code spaces if folks want to go test it out. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so it's uh, like, and definitely would love to hear, uh, would love to hear feedback about, you know, notebooks and VS code in general. Um, and then in particular, the, the kinds of languages that y'all are interested in, in seeing. Um, yeah. yeah. Hello, ladies, I'm back. Ladies. We got one, one comment from Louise. If you don't know where to start with your data and don't want to write too much code, sand dance is a great way to start. Yeah, very yeah. much agree. Yeah. I would I agree. I know about sand dance before, so I'm always learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it's in Microsoft. It's a Microsoft research project, and they are amazing to work with. Um, so try it out, give them feedback. They are listening. Yeah. Yeah, and... Um, I think we like on the learn to code page, it would be cool to show that, right? For people to that want to get started. So on the Donna side, we have a learn to code page. Let me see if I can load that. And so we'll give you all the resources uh, for you. It, it's like for, um, it will give you the, 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 the interactive notebooks extensions and will like we'll help you to get started with like installing the Visual Studio and the uh, and the coding packs for for Donet. Yep. Absolutely. And the you know one of the the other quite nice things that I love about .net interactive and the Omni kernel um, is that if you're a VS code person uh, it works great there. Um, but if you're also a person who comes from more of the Jupyter side, so Jupyter or Jupyter Lab uh, it also will be. It also is supported there, um, and and I think this this sort of uh, you know approach to to welcome communities from all angles is is very important, uh, and being able to build infrastructure that supports multiple user types and meets them where they are uh, is is really really nice to see. Um, yeah. We got a question from chat. Is publishing, packaging, and notebook as a standalone app an executable a thing? No, but it, no, it is not, but it is a frequently asked question, right? So one of the things that we've got a lot of is like, can I add a, another notebook as a package, right? Yep. Um, we get that a lot. Um, so maybe it's something we can explore. It's not a thing now. Right, but it's something that has come up a lot. Exactly, and it's it's also quite a frequent ask um, to be able to to take a notebook file, so a .ipy and b, and and to be able to to just have the ability to quickly refactor or to mm -hmm. turn it into a Python module. Um, yeah. So, so there are for for Python specific notebooks. There are a couple of open source packages that, that allow you to, to attempt to convert it into an importable library. Um, but, oh. uh, but, uh, but I don't think, to Maria's point, I don't think there's one available for multi-language notebooks yet, though no. that would be super interesting. Yeah. yeah. And do you have a public roadmap, Maria, for the .NET interactive work? Because every time I hear you do a talk, there's always cool stuff being shipped. And so, yeah, yeah. So we don't, right? I do believe that once we have the Python, like one of the things that Paige and I are hoping to do is have Python and R support, and then introducing when that will turn on. Another thing that we have built is like a validation kernel that can be used in the classroom that actually checks um, the students' work as they're looking at it. So I need to just write the roadmap. It's me. It's me. I have it in a PowerPoint. I just need to put it on our on our uh, repo. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. <gasps> no, it's good. <laughs> I, 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 need to be put, I need to be put on the spot. People have been asking for it for months, and I just yeah, it's coming. So I mean, <laughs> let's just say by September it will be there. Okay. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm I'm wrapping up my shift here at Donet Conf, so it was a, my pleasure to be here with you all.